Hello, a very warm good morning to all of you and welcome to Baiju's Exam Prep IES. Welcome to today's The Hindu Newspaper Analysis, where today we shall be discussing the important articles which have appeared in the Hindu newspaper, both for the prelims as well as the mains perspective. We shall try to look at the various perspectives and the issues highlighted by those articles. We shall try to understand why those articles have been written and what is it that they want to convey overall. At the end of it all, we shall also be taking a look at the questions which can be framed from here. Meanwhile, for each and every topic as we are going ahead with discussion, we shall try to point out those areas in the discussion from where a prelims type of question or a mains type of question can be framed. So that is where it is going to help you in order to help your preparation and strategize your preparation in the long run. After the session, I suggest to you and I encourage you to go to our Telegram page and take up the multiple choice questions which have been put up for these particular topics in order to judge your level of understanding that you have got. And before we delve into the topics, few of the important announcements. So today we will have our fifth day for the Target Prelims 2023. And today is going to be the initiation of Indian Polity and that is going to continue for four continuous days. Now here, the timing of the session shall be from 7.30 p.m. to 9.30 p.m. From today onwards, we shall be initiating Indian polity for target prelims. Having said that, we are also going to have a workshop tomorrow that is for the comprehensive preparation plan to excel in the civil services examination 2024 and that shall be held tomorrow at 6 p.m. it shall be conducted by Anubhav Saran sir and it is one of those workshops that you should definitely attend in order to gauge an idea about what to look forward and how to strategize your preparation for the next year. Having said that, now let us take a look into the topics that we are going to discuss today. So, four different topics we are going to delve into greater details. We are going to dig our teeth into it that not by Vande Bharat alone, this is something which has appeared in the editorial page. And this is about the aspect of Indian Railways where the author has tried to basically bring about the various perspectives where Indian Railways as of now always appears to be concentrated around Vande Bharat Express. So what are the metrics that we should be looking at? So that is something that this article deals with. Then Darwin's theory of evolution, which has been removed from the NCRT textbooks. So here, this particular article takes an alternate view of the fact that why it is not only important to keep these articles in the textbook, but other than that, also the mannerism in which these theories and these particular ideas are taught in the class, that also needs to change in order to have any lasting difference. There is no point simply having the topic for the name's sake. So that is something we are going to deal with. Then should India consider phasing out nuclear power? This is about nuclear power generation, nuclear energy. What is the utility of it? Countries like Germany have phased it out. So what is it that we should do? What should be our plan of action? That is something we are going to deal with. Then the threat of rising sea levels. The latest report generated by World Meteorological Organization indicating the rise in sea levels. That is something we are going to discuss about. What is the future perspective about it? And what does it tell us about the coming times? Then a couple of topics from your prelims perspective. We have an MOU which has been signed by the Dimasa Rebel Group and the Assam government along with the central government. So what that MOU is about, that is something we are going to discuss. And India sends third ship as per Project Kaveri. So what is this ship about? Very briefly, we'll cover these as well. So while we are carrying out a discussion after each and every topic, I will try to pick up two to three questions for you from your side as well in order to make it a bit more interactive. So without further ado, let us initiate the discussion for the first topic and that is not by Vande Bharat alone. Now, the headline itself, now this has appeared in the editorial page of the Delhi edition, that is page 8 of the Delhi edition. Now, this talks about the condition of Indian railways. Now, what is this topic about? What does the headline tell us? 
basically if you would have flipped through the newspaper headlines for the past two to three months as per this article you always get an idea about Indian railways being very synonymous to the glitzy one day Bharat trains one day Bharat Express trains which are being launched left right and center across the country while this is something which deserves a significant amount of celebration but at the same time whenever you celebrate you need to take a larger perspective about where the railways in itself is heading into so here you would come across a situation that almost two to three years back you had a situation where a lot of investigation was launched into the manufacturing of Vande Bharat trains. There were allegations about financial corruption, etc., which has gone on. And thankfully, that thing did not materialize into any particular real evidence or any particular real misdeed of some financial wrongdoing, etc. But nonetheless, nowadays you would have seen that every month almost one or two trains are being rolled out from the Indian coach factory. So while this indicates the benefit of local production and local production not based on a foreign technology, the local production, why we are able to scale up the level of production quite significantly higher is because of the basic fact that we have conceptualized the entire program. I hope we are aware that manufacturing of this Vande Bharat Express trains that lied under Project 18, the train 18. Indian Railways was envisaged to manufacture train 18 and was also working on train 20. The work on it is still going on. Now the name of the project, project train 18 was basically based on the aspect that in 2018 we are going to launch this and in 2020 we are going to launch train 20 while the train 18 class of trains would have four different motors in order to have the traction the traction motors as they are referred to the traction motors that are present that provide a kind of a pull and the energy for the trains to run train 20 has been designed to run on eight different traction motors and have a sleeper coaches within them train 20 is still forthcoming but train 18 is well on its way running on its tracks and that is where every other month you will find a new train 18 being inaugurated by the prime minister recently you had the inauguration of the train in kerala so that tells you that if you are manufacturing something on your own from the basic design you can always have the ability to tweak it up to ramp up the level of production and to modify it as per your own needs rather than let's say we are importing the design from let's say Canada or Germany and we are manufacturing here you won't have that kind of a flexibility so from point A to point Z the entire manufacturing and designing process having been done in India has got its obvious advantages but the condition of railways is not that which is reflected by train 18 itself while the budgetary allocation for railways has increased almost by a whopping 137 percent in the past five years alone if you take a look at it basically the annual budget increase from 2016 17 to 2023 20, 24 around six years time gap that has increased from rupees 1.1 lakh crore to rupees 2.6 lakh crore an increase of 137 percent that is humongous now this has also meant a kind of a departure from the earlier announced rail budget earlier if you would remember and if you would recall significant amount of fanfare would be associated with the announcement of the rail budget everyone used to wait with the single point of agenda that when the railway budget would be announced what would be the new trains what would be the new stations and the new routes would be announced now that particular aspect of a separate railway budget has been taken away now that means you have a significant in a way non-partisan allocation of the railway infrastructure budgetary requirement but that also means that while presenting the railway budget you would always talk about the operationalization cost and the profitability aspect what is the revenue generated etc and that would be presented before the parliament 
Now we don't have that kind of a unique document which gives you an update about the health of the railways in general. So that is something which has been lacking since the railway budget has been withdrawn and in a way it has been merged with the normal general budget. But at the same time, here this article points to a very basic fundamental that we need to understand. That in order to understand the health of the railways, the functionality of the railways, we need to have better metrics. Metrics for freight movement, that is the goods movement, as well as for passenger movement. Because when we talk about the passenger amenities, how you and I travel, now you would always have experienced the delays in trains. Almost, you will have every other metaphor which deals with Indian railways. They will also be dealing with the aspect that the trains are always late. Now here, while we manipulate or we push the figures in a way that the delay coefficient of the passenger trains is always indicated to be around 90% on time performance because we are measuring the delay from the source to the destination. If this is the destination, we measure the time that is taken to reach the destination. Now it might be possible that in the meanwhile all the different stations that the train has encountered and has passed through, in all these stations it is absolutely possible that the train has been very late. But at the destination, let's say it tries to make it up, that is where you have around 90% on time performance. And that is a significant parameter. But then, if tested on a real live GPS location, real metric which indicates the position of the train at each and every moment, this on-time performance of these trains, it reduces to around 60% and less, which tells you that the conditionalities for the passengers in terms of on-time performance has not yielded definite amount of results. Because when we talk about passengers and the passenger trains, always we take examples, let's say, of Japan where the high-speed trains, their on-time performance is measured in terms of seconds, whether a train is delayed by 20 seconds, 30 seconds or so on. And that is how on-time performance is measured. In our country, what is it that we have? In our country, if the train reaches, let's say, in one hour from the scheduled arrival time, we think about it that it has been a good journey. We, our train has been delayed only by one hour because normally people are used to the train getting delayed by six hours, 10 hours, 12 hours, sometimes even 24 hours and more. So that is where we need to be improving on these particular metrics if we want to improve the serviceability and the reach of the railways, the utility of the railways as well. But more important in terms of revenue generation for railways, I hope we are aware of the fact that railways, they don't generate revenues from the passengers. In a way, the passenger fares are always a bit subsidized. The revenue generating sector for the railways is the freight goods that it is carrying. Now the freight goods that it is carrying, so there also railway has set up a plan and that was declared in February as per the National Rail Plan 2030. Now this plan has set an objective to increase the capacity for freight transfer, right, the goods train. Because nowadays and till now, what is it that you would have observed? That on the same railway track, you have the passenger trains which are also moving. On the same railway track, you have the goods train also which are moving. When the passenger train has to be given priority, the goods train are put on a siding and the passenger train passes through. So as a result of this, what happens is that the average overall speed of both the passenger trains as well as the goods train, that reduces. The goods train, they don't follow any kind of timing. They operate in randomness where they can cover a journey of 1000 kilometers maybe in 3 to 4 days itself. And when it comes to goods transport, that share of transportation of goods has reduced as compared to the roadway sector. Even despite of the fact that railways are much cleaner, we should be prioritizing the transport of goods on railway sector. That is something which is not materializing because of a lack of proper schedule, because of cross lack of cross diversification, because even in goods, any good strain that you would have seen, recall from your earliest memories, most of the good strain would be carrying only one product, that is coal. 
coal is the dominant good which is transported. You don't have the other different types of goods, fruits, vegetables. They are carried in very minimal amount. So that needs to diversify. So here you will find that as per the rail plan, it is about catering to the future growth of demand up to 2050. So increasing the capacity in such a way that the future demand up till 2050 can be met and increase the share of railways to 45% in free traffic. Freight traffic as in when competed with airways, roadways, etc. As of now, majority of the bulk transportation of goods happens through road sector and the roadway sector. Now here, raising another target, raising the speed of the freight trains to 50 km per hour on an average from the present 25 km per hour. Concurrent reduction in tariffs of the goods by 30% to make it more competitive as compared to road sector to make it competitive as compared to the road sector so that is the purpose now here, in actuality, if you will observe, then the rail share of freight carried overall by the railways, that was around 51.5% in 2008-9 has reduced to 32% in 2018-19 for goods being transported over 300 km. Now, this indicates twin realities. One of the realities is that the road sector has improved significantly the conditions of the roads, the connectivity in terms of highways and expressways that has been increasing at an incredibly fast rate. That is one of the aspect. The other aspect to notice here is also the fact that the railways have not kept up with the pace of the economic growth. That is why there was a significant lack and there still is a need for much greater amount of capacity addition by infrastructure building. Now almost the entire increase in volume of freight transport which has been observed has been over short distance travel, not over the long distance travel. It is a long distance transportation which yields you significant amount of revenue at the end of it. Now here very briefly we will touch upon the national rail plan. This is relevant for your mains examination because when you talk about the improvement in railways you have to talk about national rail plan with a vision of 2030. This was launched in February 2023 and with a vision of 2030. So basically reduce trans transit time of freight substantially by increasing the average speed that is what we have seen identifying high speed rail corridors in between various different cities in order to connect them with high speed rail transport having a speed of 160 km per hour decongestion of the tracks which will also improve the on time performance so this is vision 24 the priority sector in the rail plan to be achieved by 2024 to increase on time performance and to also improve the functionality and the efficiency of railways in general identify new dedicated freight corridors what are dedicated freight corridors these are specialized lines which have been laid down only for the movement of goods trade passenger trains won't be moving on this what will be the consequence or the advantage the goods train can reach their destination at a much quicker time and they can also be able to follow a kind of a fixed schedule for it. So that is the kind of advantage that they will have. Then identify new high speed rail corridors because eventually if you want a relocation or redistribution of your population because right now what do we have almost the entirety of the population is concentrated in few urban areas as a result of which we face a lot of problems in the urban areas you have urban settlement issues for example you have development of slums poor hygienic conditions significant amount of pollution lot of environmental problems which are associated and so on 
on. So in order to ward off all that, you need high speed rail network so that people can come and go from far away distances as well. Now, then assess rolling stock requirement for passenger traffic as well as the wagon requirement because even for passenger movement, recall the last time that you would have tried to get a reservation on a train route you would have always found it very difficult if not impossible. So obviously we need a greater capacity addition. We need more amount of wagons or passenger coaches to move in between these areas. So that is a basic requirement which needs to be catered. Assess locomotive requirement to meet twin objectives of 100% electrification and increasing freight share. For that you need better locomotives, high powered locomotives. That is why we have had a kind of an MOU with companies like Alstom and also Siemens. Siemens is the latest one where basically the deal is to manufacture 900 HP engines whereas with Alstom we are already manufacturing 12,000 HP uh, diesel engines or electric engines rather which have a greater traction and a greater pull associated. Then sustained involvement of the private sector as well to bring in newer investment improvement of the rail tracks and so on. So that is basically the Indian rail plan. But overall, we need to analyze the health of the railways in terms of punctuality. Punctuality should ideally be taken within few minutes of the destination time. And also, financial performance of the railways. What is the operating ratio? What do we mean by aspect of operating ratio in the railways? When we talk about operating ratio, basically, it talks about that how much money is being spent in order to earn one rupee at the end of it. That gives you an idea about operating ratio. If let's say operating ratio is around 95 or 98 percent, let's suppose. Operating ratio, let's suppose, is 98 percent. That means in order to earn one rupee, in order to earn 1 rupee, the railways is investing 98 paise. So that means it is not getting any money out of it. So it is not getting enough money to invest in newer areas. So that is why financial performance needs to be evaluated and it needs to be put up in the public domain as well, very significant in a regular manner. Physical performance, safety standards of the rail tracks. Now the Indian Railways has brought about a coverage program of protection of the railway coaches and wagons where it is a kind of an anti-collision system which has been innovated in our country itself. So that safety standard needs to be also evaluated. Organizational human resource issues. Now we very proudly say that Indian Railways is one of the largest employers across the world. And we have more than a million people who are employed by the Indian Railways. So we also need to understand whether it is efficient hiring and management of the human resources which are being done or is it simply adding on resources without much fruition. So we need to have a very efficient railway system project execution, where is it that delays are happening, what are the factors leading to delays, in which areas we are having or facing those delays. So such detailed kind of an analysis needs to be presented not only before the parliament but across the entirety of the country as well. So that we are able to understand where the railways is going. Because please understand, what is the purpose behind this? What is the purpose behind the suggestion that you should table a kind of a document in front of the entire parliament and so on? The purpose is very simple. That is result-oriented allocation of budget. That is orientation towards result. Result-oriented effort. Now think about it. Suppose you are preparing for the civil services. Now you are putting in 5 hours, 10 hours. Your parents come in, they see you studying and they uh, ask you how much you are studying. You say that 
from previous month I have started studying 5 hours more and now I am studying 15 hours. But at the end of the day, the test series that you are appearing for, you are not able to succeed in that or you are not able to achieve good marks. The exams that you are appearing for, you are not able to achieve good marks and still you are continuously doing this. So ideally, that does not fructify or that does not fulfill the requirement. That is where you need a result oriented effort. That whatever huge sums of money are we investing in, when is it that we can expect an outcome out of it? Maybe 2030, maybe 2035. But we need to have a designated date that, okay, this is when this will start showing and yielding results. We cannot be shooting out into the darkness that maybe by the next decade the conditions will improve. Anyways, we come across the news stories where suddenly we are made aware of the fact that some of the projects have been delayed by three years, four years, etc. And we don't know why and so on. So that is where a greater transparency will bode well for the accountability as well as transparency for the Indian railways as well. Okay, so here that completes the particular portion about Indian Railways where we talked about the importance of local manufacturing and so on, the importance and the relevance of how you can scale up the production, what shall be the parameters or what should be the parameters to measure the efficiency and performance of Indian Railways and why it is needed, what is the national rail plan, all that we have looked at. Okay. Now, uh, a couple of questions I'll take. Uh, should Indian government focus more on freight train, which could be beneficial both for business, environment and economy of passenger train in which people then choose or afford to have tickets? Uh, Peter, ideally it would be advisable to go in both the paths simultaneously because a lot of people they travel through Indian railways so without improving let's say the average speed you cannot incentivize rail movement right if you are charging some price for the ticket people will be ready to pay only if you provide the relevant services as well if the conditions and the facilities improve that will improve when when you have significant earnings in your pocket when will that happen when you earn more how will you earn more through free travel and through free transport. So there is a kind of a definite interlinkage. That is why dedicated freight corridors, the Western and the Eastern dedicated freight corridors, they are being worked with a significant speed. And that is where we can expect to see some of the results. Um, Fatma, Vande Bharat has private sector, not a direct private sector involvement. You have small firms which manufacture few of the items, but largely it is done in the um, ICF. Okay. Ritambra Alstom is for France. Um, Sulakshana Project 18 and Project 20, these were the manufacturing endeavors of our own domestic manufacturing train where the Vande Bharat that you see is nothing but train 18. Now this was supposed to be launched in 2018 hence the name train 18. It has got four different traction motors, it has got chair cars in it, the revolvable chair cars that was the design of it. Now the train 20 is built almost on the same design slightly larger. It will have eight different traction motors so for longer distances and it also will have the provision for the sleep births in general okay Ashu is there any possibility of corruption regarding railways wherever humans are involved my dear friend corruption is always there and uh, the last question I'll take uh, before moving on uh, Kishan we should focus on qualitative accessible and sustainable development of infrastructure that is true that is where we need a kind of a result oriented effort to be put in now we come to the second particular news story, again appeared in the page 8 in the portion of editorial. This is page 8 of the Delhi edition. Now here, the article is Darwin must stay in Indian school textbooks. Now this aspect of Darwin's theory of evolution, that has been blamed and played along by many politicians over the past few years over the past few decades. Many of them have questioned about it that 
what is Darwin's theory of evolution, this uh, particular textbook or this particular scripture tells us about evolution in a better way. Now, amidst all of that controversy, there has been a recent development whereby the NCRT has dropped the Darwin's theory from the examination syllabus for class 9th and 10th students for the academic year 21-22. And furthermore, the NCRT has now dropped the entire section on evolution from class 10 textbooks. Now, ideally, if something is dropped out of the examination syllabus, that should not surprise you in the sense that later on in itself is eliminated because something which is not to be asked in the examination, I don't think any student will study that, at least in the school days. In the school days, the idea is that point A to point Z, mark it out, I will only study this much, I will not study even a word which is given outside that. So once it was put out of the curriculum for examination, it had already paved the way for the entire portion being eliminated. Now, this has met with a lot of criticism, a lot of hue and cry from all different angles that this is something which is very, very bad, disastrous. While we will examine the good and the bad of it, but what this article is special about and what this article highlights, that look, right now we are all talking about the fact that Darwin's principle and Darwin's theory has been removed. But then while it was there, how many of us read it properly? And for how many of us was it taught to us properly? Because if you ask an average individual, what is Th Darwin's theory of evolution, even though you would have read these textbooks, not many of them will be able to recount to you about the aspect of survival, of survival of fittest, natural selection, and so on. So this is an article dealing with that aspect that even while it was there, the aspect of teaching was not comprehensive. So first of all, we shall be dealing with the aspect, the need for having the theory. Why do we need to have this theory? The reason is very, very simple. Starting with the reason that this kind of a theory of evolution or any kind of the scientific theory, it gives us an idea about the methodology of origin, that how we humans have come into existence how life would have started from a small single cell organism underneath the water body around 3.5 billion years back and how that has evolved to the various different life forms that we see rather than propagating the idea that we humans or all the animals and plants that we see they have been created as per a grand design of one individual or a few individuals sitting above and they are choking out, choking out and planning out that where we have to put which individuals what kind of individual have to look in what manner which country and so on so it is important for the uh, population to understand that there is no grand design behind it there is a kind of a mannerism to evolution regardless of our beliefs this is something which needs to be understood then after that the theories they inculcate a level of critical thinking because naturally you would also recall that when you read any kind of theory any theory that you would have looked at you question yourself immediately that is that true can there be a situation where this theory is not true? Remember the first time that you would have read the Pythagoras theorem. A very simple mathematical calculation about the three sides of the triangle. There also, remember the initial days where you would have always tried to find out an exception where this theorem does not work. So that develops a kind of a critical thinking and a critical mindset which is very important in order to make progress. Whenever mankind has made progress, it has always been based on the development of that critical thinking, development of newer possibilities which can be achieved. Now, importance of science in the contemporary world cannot be ignored. And evolution is one of those things which is very, very important to understand for the development of newer medicines, drugs, vaccines, every problem that we face with. Then exposure to the evolution theories and the other theories is needed now here this is the necessity or the need why the theory is needed but while the theory was still present how was it taught 
was it that the candidates or the students were made aware about the basics of it that when Darwin postulated this now when we read the theory of evolution whosoever amongst us has read the theory of evolution in their school days ideally it was included in class 9th and 10th I'm not sure how many of us recall that but very few of us who do recall that you would have recalled that only thing which is mentioned which we all tend to remember that Darwin moved on a ship the name of the ship is mentioned, HMS Beagle. He spent five years traveling on that ship. And that is how he came upon the discoveries and the various different theories. But little are we made aware of the fact that it did not appear to him suddenly. It is not as if a lightning struck and suddenly all the information flew in his head. Darwin himself was actually influenced by the social parameters and also the thinkers and the theories floating around at that point of time. So that is where we need to understand. When we think about a theory, we need to look at the vicinity of it as well. What was the condition of the world at that point of time? What was the mindset of the world at that point of time? I will give you a simple example. When you read about the theory of evolution of a universe, now you have theories which have been provided in 1750s by Immanuel Kant, a theory which has been provided in 1790s by Laplace, his student, and then the theories of the 19th, 100s and the 20th century. Now the theory of 1700s can easily be discarded to be very wrong and very false. But you have to understand that at that point of time, in the name of universe, people would understand only the solar system. So that is why all the earlier theories they dealt, dealt only with the aspect of evolution of solar system. So it tells you about the mindset of the society, the level of scientific thinking and the critical thinking advancements which you have in any phase of the societal development. So that is why understanding the context, the pretext in which the theory has been germinated, that is equally as important as the main theory itself. For example, here, when we talk about the influence of his theory or any part of his theory, this article indicates the fact that we are not even talked about, uh, we are not even taught about the fact that Darwin himself, as he admitted it, he was significantly influenced by Charles Lyell's principle of geology. Now, Charles Lyell was a very famous geologist of those times and he had studied various different glacial movements, landform development. That was his specialty. Now, while studying geology, Charles Lyell had basically come across a kind of a conclusion that everything is an outcome of a gradual change. The mountains that we see in the form of Himalayas or any large mountains that we see it has not been created in one day. The humongous volcanic eruptions that we see, the large plateaus that we see, the vast glaciers that we see moving, they have not been created in one day. It is a slow process, gradual change. Now, Darwin's theory of evolution is also inspired from this fact that whatever is happening in terms of evolution, it is not as if that suddenly humans, we had a usage of appendix as an organ and suddenly one fine day we woke up and appendix was a vestigial organ. It was not the case that we had a very significantly active tailbone and suddenly one day we woke up and by the grace of almighty God that tail disappeared and the tailbone was not active anymore. It is a kind of a gradual change which has happened over many hundreds and thousands of years. Now that has been inspired by the geological theory provided by Charles Lyell. Now, if this is also taught, you would have an appreciation for the geological aspect as well and better interrelation with evolution can also be achieved in this. Then, social reflection of the times. After Darwin gave his theory, you would have heard about the um, famous philosopher Bertrand Russell. Now, Bertrand Russell basically after looking at his theory that survival of the fittest will happen eventually, there is a natural selection and so on in the case of limited resources, huge amount of competition will exist. Now, Bertrand Russell as a philosopher, he said that, look, whatever you are saying, 
इट इज लाइक वेरी सिमिलर टू अ फ्री मार्केट फॉर एनिमल्स एंड प्लांट्स दैट हु इज द फिटेस्ट दे विल सर्वाइव now at that point of time understand the free market theory or the license fair that license fair economics was provided by adam smith and also worked upon by thomas malthus so adam smith had at that point of time provided the license fair economics the free market economics now this indicates the reflection on the theory's evolution itself more so when you take a look at malthusian theory of competition basically when you read about population settlement transportation now there you will study about the malthusian theory now thomas malthus as a theory had provided a very simple aspect that look the rate at which human population is going to increase and is increasing that is going to be exponential he provided the similarity in terms of geometric progression that the human population growth is going to follow a curve of geometric progression whereas the resources which are available on the planet the resources are limited resources are limited that means what thomas malthus had predicted it way back in 1798 that eventually a time will come when there will be excessive burden on the resources and this has happened through the past as well now whenever you have excessive burden on the resources what will happen only the fittest amongst the individuals who are able to get the resources who are somehow able to fetch those resources only they will survive the rest of the population who don't have the access to resources who are unable to get the resources they shall be eliminated so that aspect of natural competition and natural selection which the darwin's theory of evolution also talks about this is again something inspired from thomas malthus so as you can see various different implications have been taken up now here herbert spencer had also given the idea of survival of the fittest and that eventually coalesced into the philosophy called the social darwinism what is social darwinism so social darwinism in a way talks about the uh, man in general as compared to a male and a female gender it talks about the fact that male gender historically has always strived significantly harder for finding food for getting access to various different types of shelter etc so that talks about the fact that the male gender has got an evolved mindset out of it now you might think about it that 1800s what was the condition of the society that the society thought about it that male male has got an evolved mindset and how regressive that thought process is but understand that this is an implication of the darwin's theory and that is where the candidates or the students who are studying about darwin it is not only enough to tell them about the name of the ship in which darwin was going what is it that he saw it was green forests or islands or tortoises all these kinds of fabled tales that we tell tell the kids that hardly gets the desired result or that hardly develops the level of critical thinking that is what this article is talking about that it is not about the removal of darwin's principle from the book even though that is very bad but while you are having that principle you need to inculcate that level of thinking so what is the way forward change in the teaching method of all the theories looking at the societal circumstances indication of social conditions and the discourse going on in the society at that point of time opening up the minds for newer possibilities that will herald a new era or a new area for development and future research okay i hope that is understood so in this particular article we have discussed about the influences to darwin's theory and in the larger perspective we have gained an idea about how a theory is important for the evolution in society and how it should be concentrated upon in terms of development of critical mind and critical thinking and mindset now coming on to the third article right now the third article is should india consider phasing out nuclear power 
Now this has appeared in page 9 of the Delhi edition. So it is in page 9. Okay. Now this examines the conditionalities of nuclear power as of now across the world. And what is it that is required or what should be the future decision taken by India moving forward. Because when we talk about nuclear power and nuclear energy generation, oftentimes it is mired in controversies surrounding the fact that is it safe? Is it something we should go for? Because historically, we have had few of the nuclear power plant disasters. For example, we have had the Chernobyl disaster, where significant amount of nuclear materials, they leaked. Then we have also have had the Three Mile Island disaster and of late in 2011, March 2011, we had the Fukushima disaster in Japan where due to an earthquake and a following tsunami, there was a significant nuclear leakage and radioactive leakage from the nuclear reactor placed in Fukushima. So immediately after that, it was a kind of a political move in a way where Germany immediately called upon and decided and declared that we are going to shut down all the nuclear power plants. Now, the political connotation is very different because at that point of time around 2011 and 12, most of you won't recall about it, but at that point of time, the um, person who was running Germany, the chancellor in a way, Angela Merkel. Now, Angela Merkel had a kind of a requirement to gain support from the green parties or the uh, ecological parties as they have. Now, in order to gain their support, in order to stay in power, it was very conducive and very apt for Germany to make this declaration that we are going to shut down the nuclear power plants. And Germany has done that. So the present status, if you look at it, Germany has shut down the last of its nuclear power plants. Now, does that mean Germany has opted for a cleaner method of production of power, cleaner than the nuclear itself? No, Germany is now relying on fossil fuels, fossil fuels such as oil, natural gas and even imported coal. Now that is where Germany and many of the European nations, even though they decided and they have declared it on the world stage, gained a lot of credit for that. And now the situation was that they were heavily dependent on Russia for the import of those fossil fuels, those crude oil and natural gases. That is why ever since the war with Ukraine brought, bought, uh, was something which was fought, now immediately in the aftermath, all these countries, they have been facing energy crisis. That is why the energy prices in Europe has been skyrocketing due to which the economic growth is slowing. So in a way, we can argue that Germany's decision, what it took, is not something which has yielded results as of now. We don't know about future, nobody knows about future, but as of now, it doesn't appear to be a very wise move that Germany has taken. Immediately, there was a lot of clamor call in India as well, that look at what Germany has done, we should also follow suit. But thankfully, we did not do so. Now, we'll take a look at it, why India needs this power. Now, also, the, as per the current status, if you talk about France, now one at one point of time, the nuclear powerhouse of the world, significant amount of nuclear generation. Now here also, eh, there is a significant amount of hardship and difficulty which is faced to replenish the stock of the aging reactors because that is also not an easy process. Now resurgence of nuclear power is being observed in US and Europe and that has been indicated and, the, and all the countries have caught that sign ever since the war between Russia and Ukraine that broke out. Because that is when the energy dependency on fossil fuels, that was questioned. That on what basis can we weed out nuclear power? Do we have alternate sources? No, we don't. So what do we do? So that is where it has seen an, a kind of a resurgence. Anyways, China is moving aggressively forward in terms of addition of nuclear power generators and also South China uh, or rather South Korea, if you will observe. As per its new plan, South Korea has brought about a commitment to increase the nuclear power generation in the total energy mix of the country by 30%, take it to a level of 30%. Even Japan, which suffered from the Fukushima disaster, 
and immediately in the aftermath of that Fukushima disaster, Japan also faced a kind of a crisis where Japan also had a large level of public demand to shut down all the nuclear power plants. But then Japan has also started to restart the reactors. So in this situation, what are the issues that we face? So why use nuclear power? That is a major question. What is the requirement for nuclear power? If nuclear power can be dangerous, if nuclear power can have debilitating impacts, why should we use nuclear power if at all? So here, this article highlights it in a particularly conducive way that when we talk about nuclear power as of now, we are generating only around 3 to 4 percent of our total energy from nuclear power, not more than that. Around 73 percent of our energy, 73 percent of our energy is from coal. Now, that makes us one of the biggest emitters across the world. India is amongst the top three large emitters across the world and we have greater reliance on coal. That is why during the summer season you would come across a situation where suddenly the coal shortages they start appearing. Within a month or two you would hear about the news stories that the coal shortages have been experienced in the various power plants and due to which the international coal prices will rise up and simultaneously you will face lot of power cuts and load shedding as well because the power generated will fluctuate depending upon the coal availability. So we need nuclear power in order to diversify our energy mix because we cannot be reliant only on coal. Now when we talk about the Heidel power as well, now there also we have got our own limitations, we will take a look into it. Then when we talk about nuclear power, there are also different amount of safety concerns associated. Is it safe? Because when we think about radioactivity, we immediately think about some or the other disaster. Chernobyl starts clinking in our minds. But here you have to understand that now the safety standards and the mechanisms have improved drastically and dramatically. While earlier you had the usage of active systems, for example, in a nuclear power plant, you need the coolants, you need the moderators, etc. Now everything earlier used to be operated by machines. So let's say there is an electricity failure, the machines would fail, leading to a chance of a disaster happening. But now you have passive systems, which is not dependent on the availability of electricity per se, where let's say you have the presence of a cooling system. Now even if the electricity is cut off for some reason or the other, natural conditions in that particular environment and setup would bring about natural cooling. It would not bring about natural heating. So that is why this is more disaster resilient. And anyways, disasters and accidents, they are experienced across all power plants as well. You have various different cases of boilers exploding across thermal power plants causing large and massive amount of deaths in the nearby vicinity. So that is a kind of a problem where nuclear power generation has addressed a lot of it. Then you have the radioactive waste associated issue of radioactive waste. Now the uranium which is used is only around 5% enriched around 5% enriched uranium is only used. And when that is discarded, you can think about the availability of radioactivity in that. But nonetheless, it is not discarded in the municipal waste in front of your eyes, is it? All this radioactive waste is buried deep underneath, under the ground surface in a kind of a concrete encasing. That is where it is much more safe and also much more safe for human movement across that region as well. Now, as compared to the coal power plant, when you produce electricity by coal, you produce lot of fly ash or ash in general. Now, in many of the cases, the ash generated is kept in the ash ponds in the nearby region. 
Many of the countries or many of the places have ash generated which is larger in aerial spread as compared to the power plant itself. So that also creates lot of various different problems because the ash generated by burning coal, do you think it consists of only carbon? No, in, it consists of heavier materials such as mercury, cadmium, selenium, all these heavier aluminum, silicates, all of them are included in the ash. It causes pulmonary diseases, respiratory issues, as well as long-term issues in terms of health as well. So it is not as if the other modes of energy generation are very clean. But for India, it is very imperative to have a nuclear power generation in the sense that we cannot be reliant on coal anymore. We have set our own climate goals. And India as a responsible member of the International Committee of Nations, we cannot afford to continue to emit based on coal power. And that too, when that coal is imported from various countries like South Africa, Indonesia, Australia and so on. So when there is a rise in coal prices, our electricity prices will go up. So we need a kind of a reliable output for our electricity which can generate electricity in the long run. Then limitations on hydroelectric power. Now remember, in school days, you, we all are taught about the fact that India has got immense potential of hydroelectric power generation because we have so many lofty mountains in the Himalayas, so many fast moving rivers. So we should generate more amount of hydroelectric power potential. But you also have to understand and notice about the fact that construction of dams in the Himalayan region is filled with lot of dangerous outcomes and implications. For example, when we talk about Himalayas, Himalayas are seismically active. Most of the region is included in either zone 4 or zone 5. That means they are prone to very heavy earthquakes occurring from time to time. Now, if you construct a dam in that region, that can bring about an induced earthquake. Induced earthquake. What is also referred to as RIS or Reservoir induced seismicity. Seismicity. That is a kind of a seismic action initiated due to the weight of water in the reservoir and the weight of dam itself. India has already experienced that. We have had an earthquake in Koina across the banks of river Koina and that was due to the Koina dam. So we have already experienced the Koina Dam disaster. We cannot afford to build more dams across the Himalayan region because if they break due to any seismic activity, the disastrous outcome is something which we cannot even imagine as of now. Millions can get displaced and impacted. Then you also have a limitation to solar and wind power. In terms of solar power, Basically, we are running out of those large areas where we can set up these solar power plants. And also there is an aspect of efficiency and the cost of production about the wind. It is about reliable availability of wind as well. So these are something which are in a way irregular. They are not always given with a regular supply. So what is the solution for this? Now, it is always advocated, what if they are irregular? You can have batteries which will store their energy and that will be provided in the regular interval of time. But the cost of the batteries, that is very, very high. And that is not something which is uh, practicable or executable on a large scale for a country like India. That is again another drawback. And overall, we need to understand, we need to diversify the energy mix. So here the issues cost of battery is high and also diversify the energy mix to make energy cheaper and also more reliant so that if one of the methods fail you have a kind of a backup system as well. If the coal price goes up, as last year it happened that the coal prices shot up, 
immediately lot of the parts of the country they experienced power shutdowns now in terms of economic implication of a power shutdown whenever you have a power shutdown the economic implications are humongous so that is what you need to understand from this article that despite all of the issues nuclear energy is still comparatively much more reliable is safe something that we should be investing upon at least to diversify to increase the ratio of nuclear energy generation in the energy mix from the paltry sum of three percent to somewhere let's say around 12 15 or 20 percent that will take some attention away from coal and that means a better air for us to breathe in because the coal has got its own implications okay now coming to the next topic a few question uh, uh, we will take that uh, is it not high time to concern also about nuclear waste which leads to land pollution proving proven devastating for marine biodiversity walker circulation and many such ocean phenomena see nuclear waste till now have not been indicated to have a direct impact on walker circulation warming of pacific and so on but yes they have a significant impact on land pollution and here you have to understand that the entire aspect of having the impact of radioactive waste is nullified by the requirement of having a concrete casing and properly disposing the waste so you need to regulate how the waste is disposed whether they are following the norms or not and as indicated the ash which is generated from coal power plants that is also very polluting and there you don't follow such safety norms so we end up inhaling that on a day-to-day -day basis okay so that is something MRQ uh, zonation of earthquake basically the zonation of earthquake is done in order to have an expectation that which area is prone to earthquake or not in India when we talk about zone 4 and zone 5 the zonation is done from zone 2 to zone 5 in India we have zone 4 and 5 lying across the entirety of the chain of the Himalayas and also in the region of Gujarat why in Gujarat because Gujarat lies at the tri-junction of three different plates. You have the Arabian plate, you have the Indian plate and you have the Eurasian plate. And why the Himalayan region? Because that is where the Indian plate is colliding with the Eurasian plate. Okay? Right? Nuclear liability law is uh, again an issue in terms of the fact that nuclear liability law, nobody in the... Uh, Western part of the world is ready to adhere to that because that liability law talks about the fact that if let's say I have bought that nuclear waste from our nuclear uh, enriched uranium let's suppose from any of the countries and then I have used it I have disposed it and there has been a radioactive leakage which has killed few people so the person that I bought it from that person is responsible imagine it is very similar to you going to the market buying a set of crackers and then when you come back you exploded those crackers and in the process you got harmed so the liability law in a way also talks about that the person who has sold you crackers that person will be liable for the damages that is why majority of the private sector companies of the western part of the world they don't agree with that okay Koena dam incident when we talk about the Koena dam disaster so Koena dam is a case of reservoir induced earthquake koina i hope we are aware is a tributary of river krishna now here a dam was constructed the weight of the dam created instability in the rock mass due to which you had significant amount of sliding and an earthquake uh, what are the implications faced by france to set up the jaitapur power plant so, so that is the issue the nuclear liability law of shivam is the issue why we the jaitapur plant is still stuck because India is adhering to the requirements of the liability law and France is not agreeing to it okay okay now we come over to the final detailed topic for discussion and that is as per the WMO report about the threat of rising sea levels
Now, WMO has released a latest report. WMO is World Meteorological Organization. It has released its latest report which talks about the rise in sea level and also the impact of the rising temperature. So, State of Global Climate 2022 is the report generated by WMO. And here it talks about the global sea level rise, the rate of sea level rise experienced over the past century and the impact of rising temperature. Here it talks about prolonged drought and heat waves. It talks about heat waves, right? A higher than average temperature experienced in Africa, parts of Asia, also Europe, Canada, and in Asia, parts of Siberia as well. For the past couple of years, these are the regions which have significantly suffered from a very devastating heat wave. And then you also have the aspect of droughts. Prolonged dry spell due to rising temperature means you have absolute scarcity of water. And that scarcity of water means droughts basically implicate scarcity of water. And that scarcity of water, in a way, it means what? It basically means that you don't have enough water for the plant growth, for drinking water supply, for the animals to get their share. And that is where it can lead to starvation in many of the poorer countries as well. But here, this particular article and this particular portion of the report deals with the aspect of global sea level rise, which is being experienced due to the rising temperature and the global warming. Now here, it has listed about the various reasons why the sea level is rising. Now when we think about it, when you ask any normal individual that look at it, the world is warming up and the sea level is rising, what do you think might be the reason? Almost all of you, will, all of them will come back with the same response. That sea level is rising because of melting of ice and glaciers. It is the ice and the glaciers which are melting. That is why the sea level is rising. But you have to understand the fact that while these are one of the causes, these are not the final and the only causes. One of the major causes which has been discussed in the report has been the total heat absorbed by the oceans has led to a thermal expansion. Thermal expansion means any object, it tends to expand when it's heated. So thermal expansion accounted for 50% of sea level rise in the era between 71 to 2018. Whereas you had a significant proportion of share allocated to ice loss from glaciers, ice sheet melting, etc. That also occupied a significant proportion. Now the rate at which this ice sheet loss has been happening, that has increased by a factor of 4 in the past couple of decades. So you can imagine how the situation is getting exaggerated. In fact, for the past few years or the past decade, it has meant that ice loss is one of the dominant factors of sea level rise. And this is a kind of an indication of the sea level rise which has been brought out by the report as well. Now the report has highlighted, first of all, if we take a look at the global sea level rise, it has highlighted that the average rate of sea level rise between 1901 and 1971, that is for the span of 70 years, it was only 1.3 millimeter per year. And even though we have to understand that in the past century and more, the sea level has risen by 0.2 meters, that is around uh, significantly if you consider 20 centimeter. Now, it might not seem to be very humongous as of now, but look at the rate at which the sea level is rising. So, in the seven decades up till 1971, the rise was 1.3 millimeter per year. Still significant, but not alarming. Then, 1971 to 2006, 1.9 millimeter per year. Then, 2006 to 2018, 3.7 millimeter per year. And in the past decade, sea level has risen by around 4.5 to 4.6 millimeter per year. So the sea level rise, if you observe it on a chart, that sea level rise has been increasing quite consistently. Earlier it was like this. So the level of the rise has been exponentially increasing. So what will be the implications of this? 
the implication shall be that several small low lying islands they are threatened their survivability is threatened many small low lying or many uh, low lying areas in general for example take the case of sundarbans itself now when we talk about sundarbans these are fertile deltaic regions closer to the bay of bengal now traditionally and historically for many generations for hundreds of years people have cultivated rice in the fields of sundarbans because they are very fertile now due to the sea level rise accompanied by the frequent storms and cyclones which come in these sundarbans they get flooded with sea water even though the sea water retreats thereafter but when you have the sea water present in a region that makes the land very saline and when the land becomes very saline obviously the productivity is gone so what do people do people have no option but to migrate from that area so that is where this will bring about huge amount of migration because you will have lesser amount of land available for the common population and the general population now all the various different thunderstorms and storm formation in the tropical areas that is the tropical cyclones tropical cyclones will develop only over water body we know about that fact tropical cyclones cannot develop over land they will only develop over water body now when the water level increases the frequency and the strength of the tropical cyclones will also exaggerate and why is that because with the rise of water level we are also experiencing increase in sea surface temperature sea surface temperature now this increase in sea surface temperature means more frequent occurrence of cyclones because you have intense low pressure development very intense low pressure development and when you have a very intense low pressure development the cyclone is stronger stronger and destructive as well much more destructive now the impact of all of this will it be experienced by all the population in a similar manner no always you will have the poorer sections of the society who will face the brunt the affluent section the wealthy section they will somehow manage the poorer sections they will face the brunt across the various parts of the world so that is one of the major implications the coastal areas will be flooded thereafter now what does the future tell us as per the report the future is again very bleak in the sense that in the next 2000 years global mean sea level is set to rise by around 2 to 3 meters if the warming is limited to 1.5 degree celsius as compared to the pre industrial era but we are nowhere close to achieving that target as of now the mannerism in which we are creating that kind of climate change we are much more similar or we are much more on the path to achieve 4 to 5 degree celsius of temperature rise as compared to pre industrial era so we are nowhere close to this target the sea level can rise by around 2.2 to 6 meter if the temperature rise is limited to 2 degree celsius 2 to 6 meter already means many of the coastal cities that you know of they will be submerged but if the current trends of climate change continue if there is a 5 degree celsius of warming then the sea level can rise from 19 to 22 meters from the present level so you can imagine the impact now it is not as if the sea level has never existed to that levels sea level was there long time back millions of years ago but then we are set to achieve that in the next 2000 years itself so that is why this particular report comes up with a kind of a warning a kind of a warning sign that if we continue to do what we are doing will face tremendous amount of problems many of the food producing areas they will be restricted because they will be submerged many or huge amount of money will be spent in dealing with the cyclones and the more storms and the devastation that they cause many people will face the 
reality of having to migrate from one region to another in order to survive unless and until we take some steps in order to mitigate the aspect of climate change. So that is what this particular article talks about. Now, after this, we come at a couple of articles which are relevant for your prelims examination. Uh, we'll take a few questions. How can we mitigate geothermal expansion? Geothermal expansion, no. We talk because when we talk about geothermal, it is the expansion of the planet Earth, oceanic expansion. By reducing the climate and the rising climate, we can control that. Okay. Uh, so here we aren't an island, but we too are peninsula. That is correct. The coastal areas they will get submerged. Okay. Growing hemp can absorb radioactivity of soil. Is it true? In certain cases, it has been found to, but not always. Okay, now, um, isn't the warming of sea could result into frequent number of cyclones, events such as, so that is what we have discussed, uh, Peter, that cyclonic formation, not only will it get more frequent, it will get more destructive in the coming days as well. Now, after that, we come to the portion where, relevant for your prelims, that as per Operation Kaveri, where the stranded Indians are being rescued from the war stricken region of Sudan, which is facing a kind of a unique kind of a, a warfare in between the two different military formations in the country of Sudan. So we have launched Operation Kaveri. So the namesake should be understood for your prelims what Operation Kaveri is about. Now here three different ships have been deployed along with C-130 uh, heavy uh, carriers of the Air Force as well, you have the deployment of three major ships. Now, the third ship that is INS Turkish that has been deployed of late. Now, here INS Teg and INS Turkish, they are basically Talwar class frigates. Now, these Talwar class frigates, they are basically a result of Project 11356, which have been built and designed jointly with Russia. Now here you have to understand the difference between a frigate and a destroyer. Destroyers are much larger vessels. For example, you have the Vishakhapatnam class destroyer, you have the Calcutta, Calcutta class destroyer. All these, they are larger ones. They have a greater fire power as well. They have a greater displacement as well. Frigates are comparatively lightweight and they carry out a kind of a quick strike and then escape kind of a maneuver. That is what the frigates are used for. So here, Talwar class frigates, which have been jointly developed by Russia, you should be aware of this because defense-based news are asked. That is where these have now been deployed. Okay? Now, then we come at uh, the news article where Dimasa rebel group signs peace pact with center and Assam government. Now here if you take a look at it, a memorandum of understanding has been signed between the Dimasa National Liberation Army as well as the government of Assam and the government of India. And the Home Minister announced that this marks the end of any militant group which is to be found in Assam. At one point of time, in the 90s, Assam was, early 90s, Assam was significantly impacted by a lot of various militias and militant groups, which made normal conditions very hard to achieve and very hard to even dream of. Now, finally, after signing of this MOU, we have reached that kind of a settlement where we don't have any armed group which is still active in Assam. Now, these, uh, that Dimasa National Liberation Army, that talks about the Dima Hasao region of Assam and giving a kind of importance, the political, cultural and social significance to the people, the indigenous people of the Dima Hasao region of Assam. Now here, as per the agreement, a welfare council will be set up in order to protect, preserve and promote the identity, the cultural identity, the linguistic identity of the people, right, the Demasa people, and also the speedy and focused development of the Demasa people residing. Now, here you need to be aware where that Dima Hasao region is, in which state, Assam. Where is it that Demasa people live? Assam. Now, there shall be an appointment of a commission under the sixth schedule of the constitution to examine the inclusion of additional villages contiguous to the North Kachar Health Autonomous Council with the council that is being set up. 
that is the Dima Welfare Council. Okay, so that is where a commission will be set up. Rehabilitation of the cadres of the National Liberation Army, that is Dimasa National Liberation Army. You will have 500 crores which will be allocated by both the SAM government as well as the central government in order in a longer period of five years in order to carry out speedy development. So that is what you should be aware of of the region, the people, the location, the conditions of MOU. That is it for your portion of prelims. Now, the questions which can be framed from this area. Discuss the impact of climate change on sea level rise and its effect across the globe. So, this can be for 10 marks, 150 words. Now, in this, in the introduction, you have to talk about what is climate change. Very briefly, 10-15 words. In the body, you start with the aspect that climate change is leading to sea level rise. How? Thinning of ice, melting of ice then expansion, thermal expansion, all of that you have to indicate with the help of graphical representation that how is it that what is the trend followed in sea level rise and then the impact in terms of cyclones, in terms of food production, in terms of migration, in terms of coastal submergence, in terms of destruction and devastation, everything needs to be highlighted and eventually in conclusion you have to talk about the positive steps. For example, you have to talk about that we need to take control of the changing climatic conditions in order to bring about a semblance of normalcy. Okay? Then, Nuclear power is an energy which can be clean but at the same time can prove to be dangerous. In the context of the above statement, examine the need for nuclear power generation in India. Again for 10 marks, 150 words. Here we can talk about the aspect of over-reliance on coal, need to diversify, limitation of solar and wind, limitation of hydro generation, safety of newer nuclear powers, etc. All of that we can talk about. And that will basically be more than sufficient. So that shall be all for the discussion. Now I encourage and suggest to you that take up the quiz which has been uploaded on our Telegram channel. That will be for your benefit and your analysis. If you have liked the video, if you have understood the content of it, then please don't forget to click on the like, share and subscribe button. And also don't forget to comment about your feedback about the session as well. Thank you for being patient enough. Goodbye and thank you.